This is part four in our series of lectures on section 3.4. In this lecture, I'm going to give an application of the completeness property of the set of real numbers. Namely, I'm going to prove that the number square root of 2 exists as a real number. By definition, the number square root of 2 is the unique positive real number whose square is 2. We proved earlier on in the course, as a consequence of the well-ordering property of the natural numbers, that if there is such a number, it can't possibly be rational. But we haven't yet come to grips with the question of whether or not there actually exists a real number um, with the property that its square is equal to 2. Well, we're going to use the completeness property of the set of real numbers in order to prove that it actually exists as a real number. So let me recall for you what is the completeness property of the set of real numbers. So if we take the set of real numbers and we use the usual ordering relation of less than or equal to, then relative to that ordering relation, the completeness property says that any non-empty subset of the set of real numbers, if that set has an upper bound, then it has a least upper bound. In other words, the supremum of that set exists as a real number. And so the exercise that we're going to do next is we're going to make use of that um, completeness property of the set of real numbers to prove that there really is a real number whose square is equal to 2. And I think this is quite an important exercise, and even though the argument may look a little bit involved to you, um, once you understand it, I think you'll find that it's really not all that complicated. Um, so as an exercise, I'm going to have you in a, in a future exercise modify the argument to prove that other kinds of square roots exist, such as, for example, square root of 3 or the square root of 5. Uh, you'll modify the argument that I give here to prove the existence of those real numbers. This is actually the first time you'll be proving something a little bit deeper about the set of real numbers, and um, it's sort of typical of the things that you'll do in your Math 315 class um, on advanced calculus. In order to prove any of the harder theorems of calculus, you really have to make use of this um, least upper bound property of the set of real numbers. So this is your introduction to those ideas. On this slide, I tell you what is the main idea of the proof. I give you the outline of the proof, and on subsequent slides, we carry out the details of that proof. So the idea is to introduce the appropriate set, to show that it has a supremum, and then we let alpha be the supremum of this set. We denote the supremum of this set by the letter alpha, and then we prove that alpha is the square root of 2. Okay, so here it turns out to be the right set to look at. We let t be the set of real numbers x, such that x is positive, and the square of x is smaller than 2. In order to apply the uh, completeness property, we have to show that it's non-empty. So, I observe, first of all, that 1 is an element of this set because 1 is a real number. It has the properties that it's positive and its square is smaller than 2 because its square is 1. And so that shows that t is non-empty. And now I have to show that t has an upper bound. So I say, if x is an element of t, I claim that x is smaller than 2. If I could show that, then that would prove that 2 is an upper bound for this set t. And so, parenthetically, I explain to you why x has to be smaller than 2, and I do it by arguing by contradiction. I say, if x were bigger than or equal to 2, then x squared would be bigger than or equal to 4, and that contradicts the definition of x as having a square that's smaller than 2. And, and therefore, x really is smaller than 2 for every x in t, and therefore, 2 is an upper bound for this set. As a consequence, We've got t as a non-empty subset of the set of reals. It has an upper bound, and therefore, by the completeness property of R, the supremum of that set exists. And we're going to denote that by the letter alpha, and we're going to then prove 
that alpha is the square root of 2. It's obviously positive because the supremum, the least upper bound of any set of positive numbers, has to be positive. And uh, we're now going to show that its square is equal to 2, and we're going to do that by contradiction. We're going to show that if we assume that it isn't, its square isn't 2, then we're going to show that it's impossible for its square to be smaller than 2 or bigger than 2. On the next slide, I'm going to show that it's impossible for its square to be smaller than 2. And on the slide after that, I'll show that it's impossible for its square to be bigger than 2. So the idea is, if we assume that the square of alpha is smaller than 2, then intuitively it looks as if we should be able to then make alpha a little bit bigger than it is already in such a way that the square of the new number is still smaller than 2. If I could do that, then I would have a number that's a little bit bigger than alpha whose square is smaller than 2. <clears throat> well, such a number would be an element of t, and that would contradict the fact that alpha is an upper bound for that set t, because alpha is supposed to be bigger than or equal to every element of t. On the last slide, if when we assume that alpha squared is bigger than 2, what I'll do is I'll show that I can make alpha a little bit tinier than it is, a little bit smaller than it is, still having a square of 2. If I could do that, then this number that's a little bit smaller than alpha, which has a square bigger than 2, um, will be an upper bound for this set t. And so I will have found an upper bound for t that's a little bit smaller than alpha, and that contradicts the fact that alpha is supposedly the smallest of all of the upper bounds. It's the least upper bound of the set t. Okay, so now let's go ahead and carry out the details of those two arguments. So let's first suppose that alpha squared is smaller than 2. So let's let epsilon be any real number between 0 and 1 with the property that it is between 0 and this number here. Now our assumption that alpha squared is smaller than 2 um, says that 2 minus alpha squared is positive. I'm dividing here by a positive number, so this is positive, and therefore I can find a number epsilon that lies between 0 and that number. So now I'm going to do some estimates. Uh, what I want to do is I want to convince you that with this particular choice of epsilon, alpha plus epsilon squared is still smaller than 2. If I can do that, then I will have found a number bigger than alpha whose square is smaller than 2, and therefore this alpha plus epsilon is an element of that set T, and that would contradict the fact that alpha is an upper bound for that set. So here's the, here are the details. Alpha plus epsilon squared is equal to this. I've just opened up the brackets. And now, in order to make an estimate on this, I want to simplify things by replacing alpha, epsilon squared by epsilon. So this is smaller than if I replace epsilon squared by epsilon, and that's because if epsilon is smaller than 1, then epsilon squared is smaller than epsilon. When you square a number that's between 0 and 1, it actually gets smaller. So this is smaller than this, and now I factor out my epsilon, and I claim that that is smaller than this, because from here, if you cross-multiply the 2 alpha plus 1, you see the 2 alpha plus 1 times epsilon is smaller than 2 minus alpha squared, and that's what I wrote here. This number is smaller than 2 minus alpha squared, and now this just adds up to 2, so I've proved that alpha plus epsilon squared is smaller than 2. Well, that means that alpha plus epsilon is an element of the set T, right? It's a positive real number whose square is smaller than 2, and it's also bigger than alpha, and that contradicts the fact that alpha is an upper bound for t, and so that proves that this case cannot happen. Let's now argue the other case. Suppose that alpha squared is bigger than 2, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show that I can make alpha a little bit smaller and still have a square that's bigger than 2. So let epsilon be any real number, 
and I'm going to choose it to be between 0 and this number. The reason that I can do that is my assumption that alpha squared is bigger than 2 means that this is a positive number. And therefore I can find an epsilon between 0 and that positive number. Now I do an estimate on alpha minus epsilon. I want to show that I've made my epsilon small enough that this square will still be bigger than 2. And so we open up the brackets and we observe that this is bigger than if I don't include the epsilon squared at all because epsilon squared is positive. So that's bigger than this. And if you look at this expression here, if you cross multiply the 2 alpha, that says 2 alpha epsilon is smaller than this, therefore minus 2 alpha epsilon is bigger than the negative of this. And that's what I've written here. Minus 2 alpha epsilon is bigger than the negative of alpha squared minus 2. And that simplifies to 2. So that proves that alpha minus epsilon squared is bigger than 2. And I claim that that implies that alpha minus epsilon is an upper bound for t. And I write the proof of that fact parenthetically here. So why is it that alpha minus epsilon is an upper bound for t? Well, I say, since if you give yourself any x in t, x squared is smaller than 2, and 2 is smaller than this, then it follows from this inequality by taking square root that x must be smaller than alpha minus epsilon. And that proves that alpha minus epsilon is an upper bound for t. That proves that alpha minus epsilon is bigger than anything in t. But alpha minus epsilon is smaller than alpha, and so now we've proved, we've produced an upper bound for t that's a little bit smaller than alpha that contradicts the fact that alpha is the least of all of the upper bounds of t, and so that proves that it's impossible for this case to occur. It's impossible for alpha squared to be bigger than 2, and therefore alpha squared must be equal to 2, and that means by definition it is the square root of 2. That completes the proof.